Mali's former head of state, who was toppled by the military in 2020, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, had died aged 76. According to family sources, he died on Sunday at his home in the capital, Bamako. Two years ago, he suffered a minor stroke, but the cause of death was not specified. This report examines the life and times of the late Malian president. Ibrahim Boubacar Keita was born to a civil servant father. He went on to study literature, history and international relations in Paris. He lived and worked in France for decades, including teaching at the University of Paris before returning to Mali in 1980, at first working as an advisor to the European Development Fund. Mr. Keita led Mali for seven years from 2013 until 2020 when he was ousted in a coup after huge anti-government protests over his handling of the unrest. An economic crisis and disputed elections also foiled the demonstrations against his rule. Mr. Keita was involved in politics for more than three decades, serving as the Socialist Prime Minister from 1994 to 2000. Mr. Keita who claimed to be a leftist, had the meteoric rise under the first president in 1992-2002 of the democratic era of Mali. He was prime minister from 1994 to 2000. An unsuccessful candidate in the 2002 presidential election, he took his revenge by acceding to the Kuluba Palace, the seat of the Malian presidency in Bamako in 2013. He was re-elected in 2018 against Somali Asize, then leader of the opposition who died in December 2020 of COVID-19. The coup that toppled him in August 2020 was followed by a second one in May 2021. The junta, led by Colonel Asimi Goita, had announced its intention to rule the country for several years although it had previously committed to organizing presidential and legislative elections on 27th of February to allow the return of civilians to power. Mali's new military rulers staged a second coup in May 2021, announcing a further three-year delay to elections that were meant to happen this February. This last action made them the target of sanctions this week by the European Union as well as its neighbors in the West African regional bloc ECOWAS. In Global Affairs Analyst Sam Fateh joins me to discuss the life and times of ousted Malian President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. He joins us via Skype from Washington, D.C. Good to have you join us. Um, good to have you join us, um, Sam Fateh. It's, it's, it's sort of you know, weird under the circumstance, uh, the circumstance under which we're speaking. We've always spoken about what issues, but I'm not, I'm not sure we've spoken about the death of um, a, a leader and one who was just ousted from office some years ago. How, 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 how did this news come to you? Well, it's quite a um, sad circumstance and very unusual one for that being the matter. Um, considering his age, he is old, but compared to other African leaders, he will be uh, considered much younger. And, um, you know, the circumstances are, uh, are very unusual, coming up from a coup d'etat and uh, the country being in turmoil and having a hunter uh, in power. I mean, he was arrested right after the coup and he was detained, then put on the house arrest. Then obviously the pressure from ECOWAS led to his, um, to his release. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Ibrahim Babakar Keita was going, uh, he was, the junta was allowing him to go on uh, medical treatments uh, overseas and uh, unfortunately he died in Bamako. So it's, it's kind of a, a sad situation, but also there's like this mixed uh, feelings when it comes to analyzing the entire situation and, and, and the Malian crisis. Mm. And do you think that um, the circumstances before his death 
it sort of makes it a, a bit difficult to talk about because we, we, I mean we've talked about what we've seen what leaders who have passed in office and what leaders who you know who died after office but he died after just uh, when he was removed from, by by uh, by cool do you think that that changes sort of changes the circumstances um, when it comes to talking about this in fact it makes it very difficult to talk about being an African and um, kind of sharing the same culture um, with um, IBK, uh, uh, been mending myself, it's, it, you know, it becomes very difficult because it, when somebody dies in, in that culture, um, you don't even talk ill about them. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what rise, uh, what gave rise to his removal from power, um, the allegations, of course, he came to the president in 2013 promising to end um, the corruption, um, the nepotism that mad um, Tumani regime. And obviously Tumani was removed uh, through a coup d'etat. And so that circumstance led him to coming into power even after previously losing elections uh, in 2006. So uh, then you see in his own time, there was a lot of security crisis, uh, even though he had a lot of support from the international community, especially from France, the security crisis led to a lot of dissatisfaction. Then the rise in the economic problems of the country, continuous allegations of corruption also uh, led to a lot of dissatisfaction with his government. There were mass protests, and this gave rise and the audacity that the, uh, uh, the current president, Koita, has with his junta and other soldiers to, uh, to overthrow him. So you cannot talk about his legacy. You cannot talk about his presidency without talking about some of these issues. Mm. It is it, the fact still remains that it is sad, it is unfortunate, and it is very unusual and uncommon for a president to be removed from power through uh, means of the barrel of the gun, only for him to die. You know, just a few months or few, uh, less than two years down the road. Mm. Uh, and we will get to that legacy in a moment because it's something that we do have to talk about. But I, I just want to ask you, because really, if, if you listen to the report earlier, um, it, it was stated that he, he had a meteoric rise, and really he did have a meteoric rise, on the, um, the first president in Mali, um, President Alpha Omar Konari. And you know, many thought that that was going to lead to, uh, because of that experience he had gained, he school in Paris, he, he had a lot of experience in terms of economic development. Many thought that that was going to translate into economic development when he um, took, took office. But do you think that that was that meteoric rise? He, he, used, he did seize that opportunity and used it well. Or do you think that there was something missing in terms of how um, he took advantage of the opportunities he had? Look, I think IBK came to power with all the good intentions to make things work out for Mali and to use his experience. But what we have to learn from IBK's time being the president of Mali is that no matter the experience you have outside, no matter the development you've seen outside the country and the skills you have, it cannot be mistaken that because you work for some international organization and get those experience, you can come back to Africa and be able to take control of a country and change what has been deeply rooted in these nations. I mean, I think he underestimated the, how Good. deeply rooted. Sam, let me put you on, just on hold for a minute. I want to welcome back um, our Nigerian audience. You've been seeing live pictures of the 52nd convocation of um, UNILAG, where the, the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabiamila, was speaking. We're back now to the show. Um, please go ahead. Sam, please go ahead. I just want to welcome our, our Nigerian audience. Yes. <clears throat> yes um, um, so the, 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 they're mistaken the endemic corruption and how deeply rooted these problems are uh, in Africa. You can change a government and you can put a very experienced and you can put a leader who makes well for the country. But the question becomes, is that enough to change the system? There is government change or regime change and there is a system change. And it takes, it is very difficult to, to put good changes even in small government uh, ministries and departments. Not to talk about trying to change uh, uh, behaviors or deeply rooted corruption in an entire system. We have seen it in Nigeria, where how President Buhari, for example, campaigned strongly on addressing Nigeria's security problem and in defeating, completely defeating Boko Haram and in ensuring that corruption is completely taken, uh, uh, taken out of the way. 
But, you know, when we make this kind of promises and this kind of analysis, it is different when you have a military role and be able to put decrees and be able to use democratic and legal systems and procedures in order to effect change. So IBK came with all good intentions, but the, the plan for him to change the government mm. and reform the government became difficult because he faced uh, challenges from within. Just to quickly, just to quickly um, butt in, I, I apologize again for jumping in. I, I have just a few s minutes left, but I do not want to let you go without asking you the question um, of legacy that I talked about earlier. Because when you look at where the country is now in terms of the military rule to coup d'etat, military um, um, sanctions from ECOWAS on that country, what sort of legacy? Because he's been called divisive, he's been called generous, um, both dif different extremes. But what sort of legacy do you think he leaves behind for that country when you look at where that country is today? Ibrahim Babakar Keita leaves a very mixed legacy for himself. You know, many would see him as a notable Malian who have traveled the world and uh, represented Mali very well in the international community. But when it comes to the challenges he faced back from being the president, they would also see his government as one that has been a failure, one that has not been totally successful in terms of giving the Malian people what they wanted. But to be fair to him, and from an academic perspective, he must be credited for making an effort. And one must underline the fact that he faced challenges from within his own government. And you, you cannot overrule the fact that he was, a, he was a very democratic man, a man that respected human rights, a man that, re that respected the rule of law, and a man that believed in, in, in following procedure in order to achieve what he wanted to as president. He, he, he had no dictatorial tendencies at all. So he is one African leader that you cannot accuse of trying to strong arm opponents and people in order to achieve what he wanted. I think that would be his legacy. We will see how things play out in terms of how he will be honoured and just um, the events in that country because he, he also have, um, he has supporters in that country as well. So we'll see how things play out. Thank you so much for your analysis as always. Um, Global Affairs Analyst Sam Fati. My pleasure.